Well, hello and welcome to our webinar. My name is Adam Larson and I'm the Director of Educational Strategy here at Schoology. Uh, building curriculum is, uh, is one of my passions. I, I really get excited to see great lessons put together that can lead to great learning experiences. And I'm thankful to say that I have more than 12 years of experience in education, both building out content for my own classroom and, and helping out districts with hundreds of thousands of students. Uh, that's why I'm really thankful to be part of today's conversation. But joining me is uh, even someone who has more expertise in the field of curriculum building, uh, specifically the finding and curating of great content. Uh, Fran, could you take a little time to introduce yourself and give us maybe your background? Sure, um, and very happy to be here. My name's Fran Kampar. As Adam uh, said, um, this is actually my 25th year in education. Um, and uh, my entire career really has been devoted to the profession of library media. Um, I have, um, you know, been uh, blessed to be part of um, a school library media program where I was a library media specialist and then moved on to be a coordinator. And now I'm a director of digital learning as well as an educational consultant. And all those roles really just mean that I'm in one of those fields that has been so quickly changing and evolving. And I've had the um, benefit of also being in a leadership position while that change has been going on. One of the things that's happening in the library media profession is that the library media specialist role is becoming um, one that is supporting digital transitions um, in a very big way. And the digital transition isn't just about giving devices to every student. It's really much more about the integration of technology and really good resources. So my interest in open educational resources, which we're going to talk about today, really stems from the fact that this is such a great um, fit with what um, uh, library media specialist mission is in terms of you know providing an equitable uh, type of education for all students. So very excited to be here and talking about curriculum and free resources. I don't think we could have picked anyone better to be part of this conversation and, and Fran I'm really going to be kind of picking your brain asking some questions as we go through this and, and hopefully um, as our audience is, is listening um, please feel free by the way to use the questions or the uh, area in the GoToWebinar uh, to be able to ask some questions and we'll have a specific Q&A time uh, towards the end where you can ask Fran more questions. Now one of the keys um, even in the title Fran is the right way, right? Building curriculum the right way and a question that I oftentimes get and I know that you've gotten several times is well, why can't I just use, you know, is any resource online a free resource? Can you kind of talk through that real quick for us? Sure. So the whole term of open educational resources, the key term in that is really open. And certainly it's open and free, but free resources online, which I believe that most teachers, and I know lots of teachers are out there um, listening in, um, you know, if you Google something, right, and you get to a resource, it's free, you're not really paying a subscription for it, but it really isn't necessarily licensed properly, and it certainly isn't open, which is a whole other layer to that. So, um, quite honestly, what we're going to talk about today is a better way of um, finding resources that truly are open and free. Uh, we want to really dissuade you from just Googling. And if there are any library media specialists or some people call them teacher librarians out there, they'll tell you the same, that it is really very important as we're building um, curriculum, as we're building courses in Schoology, um, that we know what is actually freely free to use. Let's put it that way. Um, so open um, educational resources are a great um, place for you to learn about in terms of being materials that are actually licensed for you to use for teaching and learning and to do research. Um, and these are resources that you may be accustomed to finding through Google, but this is actually a way that you can really enhance any curriculum building that you're doing um, because the licensing is actually um, appropriate. The intellectual property rights are actually appropriate. And that's really what is very, very key about this. So, um, you know, if you really wanted the actual definition of what is an open educational resource, they can include a variety of things. They can be an image 
Uh, they can be a video, they can be data, they can be a lesson plan, they can be an entire course, um, they can be all a range of t different uh, materials. Um, as you can tell, I'm actually in a school, so you'll hear a bell going off in the back, but I'm sure most of you will appreciate that. But, uh, <laughs> That's the realism. <laughs> exactly. It's very authentic here. But um, the free and open are really not equivalent in that definition. Um, and I think, Adam, that's really what your question was about. So when we talk about free, um, that isn't actually really free. Um, open is really the operative word when we're really talking about open educational re resources, because these are actually, they're free, but they're also openly licensed so that you can use them in a variety of ways. Um, and not only could you use them to just provide to your classes, um, as, as text to read, but they can be something that can be, in a, in a sense, mash up, um, mixed up, um, reused, revised. So that's what the power of the OER really is um, in, um, in the way that they're used in teaching and learning. Well, it's interesting in my role at Schoology, we, I work with a lot of potential clients, people who are really concerned about um, is your platform compatible with OERs? And, and I think that sometimes there's even a misunderstanding from, from their part about what OERs really are. So I know you kind of gave a lot of kind of examples. If, if you were to give me just a definition about what are OERs, what, what would that be? Right. So um, the, the operative definition is that they're free and openly licensed. And again, openly licensed is key. And they're educational materials that can be used reused and remixed for a variety of different teaching and learning purposes or even for independent research. Um, so that uh, to me is really what we are talking about today is that it's not just any resource that you can find on the internet by doing a simple Google search, but they, these are specific repositories that we're going to go to later that um, help us get to open educational resources that are truly free and open and can be used in a variety of ways um, with the proper licensing. So you're really addressing intellectual property rights. Because building, building curriculum is a, a difficult task for a teacher to take on board or for even a district to do. And I know that there's that constant lure to, to just Google, right? To find the right image, to find a video, to find maybe a paragraph to add in. And I really appreciate it, even my previous conversations with you, Fran, where I've been, I've been taught on the subject a lot more uh, and how important it is for us to do that building the right way. And again, right. I, I really appreciate that. And one of the key parts of this is that as we're really teaching within a blended learning environment, we're teaching online, um, we're not only doing this because, you know, this is the right way for teachers to um, present materials, but it's also a way of modeling for students who need to learn how to do this properly. One of the things we want to make sure is that students don't automatically like you said you know you go to google that's what everybody does right um if you're going to do a search for an image or you're going to do a search for um, one of those resources i talked about that's the first thing that you will do but if we are able to do this as teachers on a consistent basis and also speak to it to students we are teaching a lesson in context for them You know, um, another question that often comes up, how are how do OERs relate to Creative Commons? I, I hear the word Creative Commons a lot. Um, some of our audience might also be familiar with it, but don't necessarily know how, how the two kind of work together, or do they work together? Oh, they absolutely work together. So all of the repositories, places that have um, open educational resources available, um, will primarily have um, materials that are licensed through Creative Commons. And Creative Commons is actually one of several public copyright um, licenses that enable free distribution um, of any copyrighted work. So if you actually are go to Creative Commons, it's an actual website that you would go to, um, you can, if you have your own original work, you can um, copyright it and you can provide license 
licensing. You know, we are in a, a, a different kind of a world where crowdsourcing is really a very big part of how we um, operate. And um, Creative Commons allows for us to be um, a community of learners, really basically have a professional learning community um, around Creative Commons. Now, in addition to that, you can also search for Creative Commons. And if you, um, one of the things I would actually um, recommend to people is try to change your habits and change your students' habits and have them go to the Creative Commons search um, tool because within Creative Commons, you can actually search. And what happens there is that if you um, search through Creative Commons, you will only get um, whether it be images or videos or text documents that are already filtered for the proper kind of usage rights or the intellectual property rights that are under the whole idea of providing that right to share in Creative Commons. Now, so, I know I, I'm displaying right now the chart that you shared with me. Can you can you kind of, kind of talk through that? Sure. So this is um, these are all um, on the left hand side. You see the little um, icons, right? Um, and those icons um, basically are types of licensing on, under Creative Commons. Um, and each of those reflect what you can do with a particular piece of material or, or you know, curriculum material that you find. Um, either through Creative Commons or one of the other OER repositories. Um, and it starts with the idea of there is content out there that's free um, globally without restrictions, which is the public domain. And uh, many of you have, you know, are, are very familiar with that term. That's the whole idea that there is no intellectual pro property copyright with that. But then what you typically find, most likely find, um, is the icon that looks like that second one on the second row where, where it says attribution only or alone. And what that means is that um, the, the person who did the licensing, who actually put it through Creative Commons and got that licensing, what um, they are basically asking is, you go ahead, you can, you can use it, you can remix it. See the, the, the categories on the right-hand side? It says you can remix right. them, you can, um, you can use them commercially, which is like a very different kind of thing for most teachers, right? Um, you can, um, even it's open, so you can redo whatever you want with it, but they ask for attribution. What does that mean? Give them credit, put their name on it, and you're all set. Um, and you don't have to, you know, write to them and, and get permission to use it. You can just use it. They're saying, go right ahead. Um, the second one is the attribution and share alike, which is the one that I tend to like. And if I would be doing the licensing, that's the one that I would actually use. Reason being is that I think it's important in giving back. And what I mean by that is that if you are using Creative Commons Open Educational Resources, it's just as important to be not only a taker, but a someone that shares. So attribution and share alike, the, the, uh, the buy-in, the SA, basically says, yeah, go ahead, use it, do whatever you'd like with it, create another original work from that, but be sure at the end of it, if, especially if you've created something new and wonderful from it, go ahead and share it again and put it back into Creative Commons with a new um, licensing. Now, that one's specifically interesting, I think, because when districts are looking to build curriculum, sometimes they're, they're looking to do that in a restrictive way, right? Like they're wanting to build out these lessons and, and maybe later on they want to sell those or they want to, um, you know, make those available. Would, would, would the share like kind of be the, would that be a thing where they know you're, you're not allowed to sell it? It's not for commercial purposes at that point or? Well, they can, um, but what, well, no, because in, in a sense, that's an excellent question because I actually had to think about it. You, you basically are, <laughs> asked to provide, yeah, you know, you caught me there. I like that one. Um, you're basically asked to provide credit, but you're also asked to share what you have just created. Okay. So, okay. yeah, you wouldn't do that. You would probably go on with the next one, which it says, um, attribution and no derivatives and it really isn't asking you to share right the, there's no essay there 
Um, no derivatives basically means, yeah, go ahead and give me credit, but I also don't want you to do anything with it that's going to be, um, that's going to make it look different than, you know, my original work. Um, or um, you go on to the next one and it says, yeah, go ahead, give me credit, but you also can't do what you just asked about. I can't sell it. I can't, I, I can't use it commercially. So NC for non-commercial. Wow. They also have something where you attribute it, it's non-commercial, but they also want you to share. I definitely think this is a helpful graphic that's available. And and by the way, for those of you who are listening, um, Fran, I had the opportunity to talk to Fran about this earlier, and she was talking about how the, the great thing about going to creativecommons.org and doing all your searching that way is that all these labelings, these icons, come with that content. And you'll actually be able to see that later on as I, I go through the site. Um, that if you want to actually see what kind of the licensing is for those materials, Creative Commons provides a great way to showcase that, where if, if you're just doing a Google search or something like that, you might not be able to tell what kind of item this actually is. That's right. Um, and, and you know, after a while, when you, you started using um, Creative Commons, um, you start, you know, understanding what that little icon and there aren't that many of them and i think that it's really just important for you to know oh that's the kind that i really can use and 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 change the way i want like i said i tend to like the ones up on top where um they can be remixed and reused and i don't have to worry about um you know the the licensing not allowing that right well the, the next thing that we talked about earlier is uh, the benefits of free and open resources. And it's interesting when I think of open resources, what always comes to my mind is, yeah, well, yeah, it's, it's a cost savings, right? That I always think of that first. But when we were going through our conversation, you were mentioning a lot of other benefits to it as well. Could you kind yeah. of talk through some of those? Sure. I, I actually agree with you. Um, as we were talking, I, you said to me, which one of these is, if you had a look at the benefits and say, geez, you know, which one of these is really the, um, the, the biggest benefit or the most important? And, you know, I said, I have to be honest. I really think that most districts, most schools that, um, you know, go on to wanting to use more free and open resources are looking at saving money. Um, as you know, textbooks are very expensive. Um, I've got some figures here that are really kind of eye-popping. You know, over $9 billion were spent on textbooks last year. Um, wow. So that in of itself, if you think about, and that's just textbooks. It's not like the additional um, worksheets and, and different teacher resources, all of those things that um, might, um, you know, be costly. And um, that's one of the reasons why, and probably the top reason why all districts go into this OER. However, the benefits um, are many and um, they are automatically part of this. So if you start using them because of the cost saving, you then have um, this part of it that I really like, the digital equity. So it doesn't matter what what funding your district receives, right? So, you know, there are districts that have more money that are able to spend on resources, textbooks, et cetera, but there's a certain equity of um, resources that come from this. And one of the things that I was I was basically explaining to Adam we thought was interesting is that um, in the past year, one billion uh, works were licensed under Creative Commons. Um, and so more and more, billion? one billion, so that means that, you know, we talked about creating something and then giving back and sharing alike. Um, that's great because then there's that many more resources that are available. The other thing is that if they're up and, you know, they've just been put up in the last year or two, they're going to be a lot more current. They're going to be a little bit more relevant to what the students are teaching. So sometimes, you know, because of funding cycles, textbooks are outdated um, and they get outdated very quickly. Um, but this is, you know, a case where you can actually keep it relevant, keep it current. Um, and you're, the one other thing that I really like about it is that in the very beginning, and maybe some of the, the publishers are still doing this, um, textbooks were, you know, they turned into online by basically creating PDFs. 
and you had, you know, nothing that was really interesting. But most of the OERs, especially if you're um, curating them and you're really personalizing them to your curriculum, they're going to be much more interactive and dynamic. And I think all of these um, things that we, you know, just talked about, you may start with, well, let me save some money, but you're going to end up with all of the rest of the benefits. And there are probably some here that um, would be even more that you could see. Um, you know, I put in the ability to make it personal. Um, the fact that you can, um, at a glance, you know, find different resources that might be um, really helpful to different students, I think is really very important. And um, you're not going to be able to do that necessarily with something that you have to buy. So again, it's free, but as a result of the free, you're going to be able to provide a lot more for your students. And you know, I think something too for you know for those who are listening, you know, some some might be from districts that have spent you know a lot of money towards uh, publisher content or towards specific content providers. And I, I think the overall thought for us today for you is doing a, a both approach. It's not OERs versus publisher content, but there's there's free stuff out there over as Fran mentioned over a billion different content items that are available for for usage and if you can find one of those things that could help your students achieve more success, it's worth your time. Um, and, and hopefully you'll, you'll do that. Now with that in mind, what are some of the strategies for finding and curating OERs? And you know, I, I think even to start off this conversation, Fran, is, is that there, there's not an, an OER silver bullet, right? And what I mean by that is that it's, there's not gonna be one site that's going to have everything that you need. There's not going to be one particular piece that's going to have, you know, the, the whole kit and caboodle. Um, it might be close, but it, it really does take a strategy for districts to find and, and curate good content. Right. And this is absolutely true. There isn't going to be that one place um, that's going to have exactly what you need. Um, you're going to have, you know, teachers obviously are teaching different grade levels and different subject areas um, and are looking for different types of resources. And right now, there's a number of different repositories that are available um, and they all have their strengths. Um, so it could very well be that as you're looking um, and looking for something that meets your needs, you may need to go to more than one. Um, one of the first places I always start is OER Commons, uh, because that tends to have um, a lot of things aggregated within it. Um, OER Commons is also fantastic if you're looking for um, lesson plans, for example, and unit plans. Um, it is um, like a lot of the, the sites that we you're kind of looking right now on, at the slide with all of the different uh, um, possible places that you can go and, and search. Um, it has uh, standards alignment, so you can actually search by standard. Um, it has um, by subject, by um, type of object. Um, it does um, quite a bit, and um, it really does have a lot of resources. But I just recently um, had to find something for a particular unit that I was thinking about. And I found myself going to at least three. Um, that's why I think that what Adam is saying, you're, you're absolutely right. I think that um, I found something in OER Commons. And then I said, you know what? I needed something else. So I went to CK12. Um, and then I went to Curriki. So you'll see that they're all on here in Guru. They're, each one of these, like I said, have um, a variety of resources. Yeah. What you're going to find is as you start using them, you're going to find some favorite go-to places for your particular needs. Um, as somebody that, you know, oversees K-12 and library media as a director, um, I'm obviously bouncing from one thing to another because um, I'm looking for things that, you know, are appropriate to a variety of grade levels and a variety of subject areas. But you may find, you know, for example, that you're going to go to Guru and um, that's going to be fine for you because they have lots on language arts and math and that's what you really need. Um, so 
I would say um, these are like the go-to in terms of starting. If you want to look at, um, you know, uh, OER repositories. There's two that I think a lot of you might be familiar with. Learn Zillion and Excitement um, have been out there for a while now. Um, and I know a lot of schools that use them. Um, and they are free to use. Uh, most of their content is, you'll have to check for the licensing, is actually licensed under Creative Commons. But um, they also are uh, fabulous for um, close reading, for example. Um, so, like I said, you're going to have to do a little bit of um, uh, exploration. And um, for those of you who help other teachers, because you are in the library media specialist type of role, I would su suggest that you look at all of them and you take a look at what they all have so that you have a really good understanding of if you're going to support teachers, which one is going to be the best. Now, there's a couple in there, and I don't know if we have any higher ed folks out there, um, but just for, for you to know, there are full courses out there from Open Michigan and the Orange Grove and Merlot that happen to be on the higher ed level. But if you are a high school teacher, if you're teaching an honors course or an AP course, for example, I would say you can go to one of those sites and you'll find courses that will basically align with what you teach at the high school level too. Now, Fran, it was interesting. You were kind of mentioning the, the aspect of, you know, some of those listening to us are are helping other teachers. You actually have kind of a, sort of a, a, a way to get started finding and evaluating OERs. Can you kind of go through this six steps that you, you have here? Sure, yeah. So um, this is actually modeled on, um, you know, what we call the research process for curating resources in any kind of setting. You know, if you're in a library media, it'll look very familiar. But um, essentially what this is, is that you want to start with what is the question you're trying to answer? So what's the purpose of what you're doing? What are you trying to address? Do you have a gap in um, your standards and you're trying to actually fill that gap? Um, is there something that, you know, maybe you, you just need a few extra images or you need um, question prompts or you need, um, you know, an additional lesson plan, an idea for an assessment or a performance task? What is it that you're really looking for? And you have to start with knowing what your purpose is. So you start with that in mind before you actually begin your um, strategy so you actually have your question in mind your purpose in mind and you start with um, planning what you're searching and, and curating is going to be so i would actually say you you go ahead to creative commons that might be a place where you can um, go and find the video you're looking for or the image you're looking for but then if that is um, not enough you can go to one of the recommended um, open educational resources repositories that we just showed you on the previous slide wow. um, and I think that it's really important for anyone doing this because you're gonna find a lot of stuff <laughs> let's put it that way you know when you have you're, you're doing lots of web searching and you're trying to put things together you need to have your own strategy for curating so it may not be as simple as I found the source and I'm good to go you may want to find five or six and then take a look at them and evaluate which one you really want to use. So you need a curating um, uh, strategy. And one that works the best is the one you're going to use. I, for example, love Google Keep, right? It's part of the Google um, G Suite suite. It's one of the apps that's integrated. Um, I'm in a website, I use the extension, that's Google Keep extension and I send it to Keep and I tag it with whatever, you know, I, I was, for example, just this morning, I was looking for a unit on the Constitution. So I was looking for resources using one of the OER repositories. And I was finding a lot of great ideas, but I didn't want to like basically evaluate and organize it yet. I just wanted to continue because once you're on a flow, you want to continue, right? Right. Uh, so, so I just kept on sending it to Google Keep. If that, if you have a better um, curation tool, um, 
use it. Um, you know, there, there are lots of great tools. Uh, Flipboard is another one that works really well. Um, you may just want to just have like an ongoing Google Doc where you just keep on putting your, your, your um, URLs and, and the information in it. You just need to find a way that is going to work for you. It's interesting. Sometimes even the individual OER has a built-in kind of login that allows you to kind of save that content too. Exactly. Now, if you're going to stay, you're absolutely right. If you're going to stay within one uh, repository, what I found is that I, if I flip from one to another, I don't want it in that one, right? Because I want it, I want it all in my place because I may have gone to three different places and I don't want it in their dashboard. So you're absolutely right. Some of them, if you tend to go to one and you stay with that one, they have a way of saving. So you can save it right within that repository. So you know, it's, it's interesting, Brandon, you've been talking, there's been some questions coming in, and I, I think it really relates well to the next um, slide. So let me pull that up. Uh, I don't even know if I'm allowed to say this on our webinar, but I'm going <laughs> to hopefully try a, evaluating resources with a crap test. Um, yes, I think that some of you will want to teach this too. <laughs> yeah, one of, one, of the, one of the comments or questions from the audience was, you know, you know, with all the OERs that are out there, how can you, you know, are, are there pros, are there, are there the good things or bad things? And I think this might kind of help with his kind of question. What right. What is the crap test? <laughs> the crap test is an actual um, criteria for evaluating all web resources that a lot of library media specialists like to use and a lot of students like to say. <laughs> so uh, basically what it stands for, and it's an acronym for um, looking at a variety of different um, parts of a web resource or any resource, right? You want to look at their currency. How Remember how I talked about that you can get things that are much more current uh, than maybe, you know, textbooks that you have? Um, so you look at the date, you know, when was it actually created and, and when was it actually um, out there? So how current is it? How relevant is it? You know, sometimes you'll find something that's on that topic, but it has absolutely nothing to do with what your learning objective is. So you want to look at the relevance. So those are the, that's the C and the R. Now the two A's are probably the most, well, I'll give the P2 a lot of, lot of importance. The authority, who wrote it? Where's it coming from? And that actually has a lot of questions about it. So is it coming from a reputable source? Um, is it, um, you know, with the whole uh, conversations out there about fake news and how do we teach, you know, students news literacy and even adults news literacy, authority is really, really important. So where is it coming from? So you really want to look at, is it um, a, a reputable um, organization? Um, oftentimes, um, you know, you'll see, you know, places like Khan Academy that, that have things out in all these OER repositories, we know where that's coming from. So you know the authority of it. So you want to know who wrote it. Is it a, a professor with, um, you know, they, they've done a lot of research and this is their expertise, or is it a student that just wrote something and is up there? It's not going to be in the OER repository, by the way, but that's what we look at is in terms of um, the, the author um, and the authority. The accuracy is also important. I think you just need to take a look at it from your expert uh, point of view is, is it accurate? Are you finding things in it that are really not quite you know, factual? Um, and then what's the purpose? Because in, um, in evaluating um, any kind of resource, sometimes you'll get a resource that it's pretty good, but there's a bent to it. There's a bias to it because it's coming from, um, you know, I, basically, you know, if it's an, it's an organization that um, has a particular point of view, for example, they're going to have that purpose in mind. So you want to think about CRAAP as part of your evaluation as you're going through your resources. The other things um, that because this is online, you're going to also want to consider the text specifications of it. Just in case it's one of those things where it, it asks for flash or, you know, something where it's not going to work on whatever devices your students have, right? You want to make sure ahead of time that that's the case. You know, and you know, Fran, something that a, 
question that came up, and I think we should probably address even earlier than this. Um, I, I forgot to. Um, someone was asking, like, where do, I mean, and you mentioned it under the authority aspect with Khan, Khan Academy. Like, where do Khan Academy and YouTube videos, for instance, fall into OERs? Like, for instance, would, would a teacher consider those OERs and could they use those in a course? Can you talk yeah. a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, and actually, um, one of the things, like with something like Khan Academy, it's very helpful to go to their, um, every single website has terms of service, you know, how, how you are allowed to use that particular uh, resource. If you actually go to the Khan Academy um, usage rights, you'll find that they are really free. Um, they're free. Um, I wouldn't say they're open, but they're definitely free, which means that you can use them. You know where they're coming from. Um, and you just can't like redo their whole video and, and make it your own. So it, it's not modifiable in that way, but it is, it is free. Awesome. So again, you know, for, for those teachers might, who are out there listening, you know, what we're basically saying is that yes, anything that's available online, well, and Fran, correct me if I'm wrong here, you know, if things that are available online, if you link to those things from your learning management system or from your website, you know, it's it's obviously going to their live site. The, the problem is when you're oftentimes building curriculum, sometimes those pieces get put into the mix of, of your curriculum. And, and that's always just an important thing to remember. That's right. That's right. And and keep that always in mind in terms of, you know, where are you linking to? What are what are the the, the usage rights there? That's uh, that's as important for um, like a Khan Academy as it is what we're talking about, the open educational resource. It's the same type of uh, thinking that you need to have. Now, one of the things that you've mentioned is a huge benefit of OERs is this are these four R's. And I really like how you put this in, in our conversations before, which is, you know, where the four R's meet the four C's. Can you talk a little bit about this one? Sure. And, and this is actually why I think that the open educational resources have the most um, not only use, but, you know, possibilities because um, they're not only for reuse. And we talked about the licensing for that. But I think what's even more important is that you're allowed to remix and reimagine them and redistribute, uh, actually, you know, share them again. Um, so if you were to just provide, um, let's just say, a, a video or text um, for consuming, you're only basically um, saying to your students, you're just going to consume. But you can remix things that you find, uh, videos, audio, etc. Um, in a way that provides the ability for students to have a much more engaging, creative, um, and critical thinking type of experience. Um, as an example, one of the things we were talking about, Adam, was you can actually, in some cases, use a video um, that has the, the narration and strip the narration from it because you can remix it. And then you can reimagine it by providing a different kind of a prompt to students and saying add your own narration to this and so by using those types of instructional strategies and by taking resources and making them much more dynamic you're providing students with more opportunities than they would normally have by just consuming and then just answering questions you're providing them with um, opportunities to think critically and uh, creatively and um, co uh, collaboratively you, and obviously that these could be all group projects and then you can have them communicate out in much more um, original ways so they get engaged in the content and they get really invested and they make it their own so this is to me the power of the open part of the educational the OERs is the fact that you can mash it up and you can do anything with it. And it's not about just the teacher using it, it's about giving it to the student and having them mash it up. Think about that possibility. Yeah. I think especially with the blended learning classroom, you know, getting more and more adoption, you know, what, what teachers and students are wanting is not just more content, right? More, more videos to watch or more things to read. 
um, but they're, they're actually wanting things to actually engage them in the learning process. So uh, I think the video example is, is a good one, and I'm thankful that you did not uh, relate that whole story of m my issues uh, <laughs> with that process. Uh, but but no, the whole idea of, you know, here's the video, make it your own, right? And, and being able to have a content like that. Exactly. If you start thinking about OERs as something you're providing to students, but not for them, actually, instead of to them, um, I think that, that that's a really big leap and you can start actually really being much more creative with what you're doing. Okay, Fran. Now, I have a question that I, 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 don't, I don't think this is going to stump you, but we, we have a, uh, a very good question uh, from one of the audience members who, who is basically asking, you know, with open educational resources, they're, they're great, they're important, but, you know, with Google out there, there's nothing to stop students from, or, or teachers or districts from just taking content and putting it in their stuff. Um, and the question is, what, what can be done to really stop them from doing that or it really is there a way to stop them well look i mean this is a life skill we're we're kind of like and i know that this is going to sound like well you really aren't stopping them this way but there there's very little that you can do once they leave your classroom right you the, you only have them in the classroom and you can teach them um, what's the proper way of um, being ethical about, you know, using uh, resources. Now, certainly, once they get into college, that's also going to be reinforced. And once they're in a career, once they are actually working, um, you know, there is absolutely um, a mindset that's changing now to the idea that you really need to be ethical in how you use intellectual property. Um, and there are, you know, I, I have to say, there are companies out there that if you use their stuff, you may end up getting a cease and desist letter from a lawyer. Believe it or not, it's happened. I've seen it. Um, if publishers see you using something and you haven't attributed or you're using it incorrectly, they will call you on it. Um, Disney is famous for, you know, going through uh, online and finding things and saying, hey, take this down. Now, I get what you're saying, that they may be handing something into you, but you have to require um, that they cite um, images, that they cite, you know, all of the things that they're providing you. If you have that requirement, and if that's part of your assignment, then it's something that you're teaching the students to do on a regular basis. I don't know if that answered that question, but it, it's a tricky one. You really have to um, set the, the bar high and you know ensure that the students meet, meet that. Yeah, and I, and I think the point of OERs as well is that it's, it's not denying reality, right? We, you know, open educational resources understand that there are a lot of resources that are out there that aren't open and that they're not maybe even free. Um, but that doesn't that, that doesn't stop the fact that there there's right practices and like you even mentioned Fran like this is a citizenship a digital citizenship type issue and something that can be reinforced by what we allow as teachers and what we do as as districts. That's right. That's right. Um, so this is really a responsibility for teachers, you know, to teach um, these skills and actually model them. As I said in the in the beginning, I think we're we're the you know the best. A shot that students have at uh, being real digital literate citizens. Now, um, with that said, I wanted to actually take the last bit of our, our webinar to actually see what, you know, using OERs looks like in action. And, and obviously, this is a Schoology webinar, so I'm going to kind of be uh, talking to you from the perspective of, of a, maybe a teacher who's using Schoology. So I'm going to open up the platform and I'm going to talk through three different scenarios and talk about how Mr. Bates, who is our uh, biology, our, our life science teacher, um, kind of uses OERs. And Fran's going to kind of um, jump in too at, at some various points. Now, for those of you who are not um, familiar with Schoology, this is uh, actually a, the, a course page. So right now I'm in Mr. Bates' uh, life science course. He has all his different periods uh, assigned to one course. And so he has that kind of access. And what he's working on today specifically is this photosynthesis exam. He's wanting to create some questions um, that students can go through. And, and specifically, he's using our new assessment tool, which actually allows for a lot of new question items, um, ones that you might not even be familiar with. 
Um, right now, uh, even some of our enterprise users are being able to take advantage of these, but if you're, a, for instance, a basic user, you, you have not seen these questions yet. Um, so the question that he's working on specifically today is a show the cycle, which is a highlight image. And basically, he's wanting uh, students to have an opportunity to actually draw right upon an image, and, and they're needing to show the photosynthesis cycle, how sunlight, oxygen, carbon dioxide interact to, uh, in the photosynthesis process. So what he's going to do is he wants to find an image for that, and he wants to follow the open educational resources kind of mandate. So he's going to jump over to Creative Commons, and I'm just going to open up Creative Commons here. And this is actually the, the website, so if you guys have had a chance to already click on that, that's this is what Creative Commons looks like. And underneath Use and Remix, there's an ability to search the, the commons. And I'm going to switch this over to a leaf, so I want to search for a leaf on this particular example. And when I do that, it opens up this search window. Now, there are a lot of things here. Fran, can you talk through like what's what I'm sure. seeing right now? Right, so so Adam's actually going to go right into Google Images, which is great. Um, and you know, basically, what's what's going to happen is that rather than going directly to Google and then trying to filter through the usage rights, and there's a whole advanced search that you can do this. Creative Commons is doing that automatically for him. So what he's searching, Leaf, it is also going to come back automatically with only the images that he can use for commercial purposes and that he can modify, adapt, or build upon, which sounds familiar, right? What we've been talking about. But there are other, um, if he's looking for images, there's a lot of other places he can go. There's uh, Flickr, which you're all familiar with. Um, there's clip art, and if you're just looking for, you know, some kind of like line drawing, that really will be a great place. Um, and the other one that I like a lot is Pixabay, and I was explaining to Adam before that Pixabay is um, much more user friendly for elementary um, age students. And so, you know, sometimes you'll go into Google Images, and even if you're filtering them for um, OER, they may not be appropriate to that age level, but Pixabay tends to be a little bit more so. So go ahead, Adam, and go right through that. Yeah, okay, so I'll, I'll click on, so Mr. Bates can click on Google Images, and when he does that, something that even uh, Fran mentioned is that there's actually a filter that's in place for images. By the way, this isn't available on any of the other options, but under Images, it's labeled for reuse with modifications. So this is actually open resources that are available, and he can now click on maybe this picture of this particular leaf. And when he does that, he can right click, get that, that URL. And when he does the, gets the URL, he can open up Schoology again. And when he opens up Schoology, he can now just copy that, that text right into the area. And now when he goes to preview that question, he can have the image inserted directly in. The nice thing about this is that this curriculum is, again, open resource. This is something that he's taken from the OER kind of space with correct creative common licensing and put it directly into his course ready to be used. And by the way, if you haven't seen the highlight imaging questions in Schoology, it's a real treat. Um, we'll be following up with uh, some ways to see that more. Now, the second scenario I wanted to talk through is like, okay, so now he's in his ecosystems folder. So he's gone out of the, the specific one on uh, photosynthesis, and this is what he's greeted with, empty content. Um, with this, he's going to go to another OER location, and that's a, the OER Commons. And I think this has, uh, Fran mentioned this earlier, I think OER Commons is a great way to get really like high level things about your units and about lessons. So he's gonna actually select um, ecosystems, which is the, the topic that he's really wanting to see more information about. He can choose what subject area, the education level, the standards that he might be interested in. And when he goes to search, it pulls up a lot of different resources. And the one that he's going to see specifically is the rated. He's gonna click on the environments and ecosystems, and it pulls up uh, this particular resource. Now, the important thing to know about um, uh, OER Commons, and again, Fran, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that OER Commons has a lot of high-level documents. So it's not necessarily something that you're wanting to directly put into your LMS because um, it might not be interactive, right? It might just be a lesson right. plan, but it's still beneficial for Dr. B or Mr. Bates. Fran, were you going to say something? Um, yeah, no, and I wanted to also point out OER is kind of interesting that if any of you really want to see um, 
a much more kind of stringent evaluation. You can actually evaluate right within um, OER. There's an evaluate uh, button right on top. So uh, yeah, just just for you to know that it, it is possible to go right into a rubric and evaluate. If you're doing this with a group of uh, teachers and you're all you know working on this photosynthesis unit, um, it might be something where you might might want to evaluate evaluate all the things that you're coming up with before you actually do your final curriculum. But as an individual teacher, go ahead, Adam. I think this is the right way to approach it. Yeah, so, so essentially you have the, the lesson here, environments and ecosystem, you have a summary. And what Mr. Bates wants to do first is that he wants to actually create this as a lesson plan. So if he toggles back into Schoology, he can go up to add materials and then actually select add file or link. And he's gonna create a link where he's just gonna copy in the URL, and then uh, title it lesson plan. And then he's actually gonna unpublish that. So now within this ecosystems folder, he actually has a link directly to that lesson plan that he can refer to um, as he goes, poss possibly uses it this year or even next year. Now if he goes back into the OER Commons area and he scrolls down, he sees that there are a couple of different assessment options. Now this is the big thing I wanna point out. This is a traditional lesson plan. So it has, let's say, a pre-unit quiz, it has ideas for group discussions, it has maybe a picture discussion, but none of these are actually like content items. You know, some of them might be tied to a worksheet, some of them might be tied to a, you know, a PDF that can be downloaded, but they're not necessarily content items. But what he can do is that he can take, let's say, this group discussion, copy that text, and then within Schoology, he can go up to add materials, and now he can actually create a discussion. So he can do add discussion, putting the title in the description. And then when he creates that, now that discussion is available for his students to actually be able to take part in. So again, it's a great way to be able to see free content that's out there, be able to see great lessons that are rated and, and um, commented on by the greater community and be able to pull that into his actual course. Right. Now the, the last scenario is I want to show you one of the great um, integrations that Schoology has with CK12. CK12 is um, one of these OERs that was mentioned earlier. And with Schoology, it allows you to actually create content right within the platform through the integration. I want to show you how that works. So if I am Mr. Bates, all he has to do is go up to Add Materials. And now on the right-hand side, there's this CK12 app. And when he clicks on the CK12 app, it actually opens up the CK12 repository right within Schoology. So he's not going to another website, he's not going to another link or opening up another tab, it's right here in a pop-up window. And then he can go to the search window, he can search for, let's say, ecosystems. And when he selects a particular one, it's going to pull up all the resources that are available in CK12 that are actually content items for students to go through. So maybe you want them to read something or an article, maybe it's a video, or maybe it's a, a link to a, a real world website. In this particular example, he's gonna choose an assessment because he wants the students to actually go through some questions. And when he presses add, now that CK12 piece of content comes right into the platform. And this is where students can practice this particular concept, videos that they can watch and things like that. So especially when you're looking to build curriculum in, in Schoology, integrations that we have like CK with CK12 or with open ed resources or a lot of others, look for those kind of open ed resources that actually have content that can maybe be pulled in to build out your curriculum. It's, it's a great way for Mr. Bates to have some really high level content. That's great. One question I had, Adam, was does, um, does CK12 need to be added as an app? It does, and actually what can happen for a institution is that they can have, um, the system admins can request from CK12. Um, by the way, we have a blog article all about this that we'll be able to send out after this meeting, but essentially it's uh, an app that can be configured at the institutional level, and once that app is added, all the courses within the institution, when they go to add materials, you can have that um, CK12 app. Same thing with like open ed assessments, um, even Merlot uh, offers those kind of functionality right within the platform. Right, that's great. Now, I know that was a brief kind of looking at uh, OER in a lot of different ways. Um, I wanted to kind of end that part with kind of this overview that you had for us, Fran, of, of some kinds of the workflow of using OERs. 
Right. So, you know, one of the things that um, I think is really important as you're considering it is that, um, you know, besides the whole planning, we talked about a lot of that part of it is the technical workflow of it is when you're actually um, going to use something, it's important that you consider what format you're using. So if you're using, for example, an image, what, what, um, you know, what kind of image can you use, a video or the file? So consider the format as, as, as one thing. And then consider the delivery. Are you actually looking, and I think you went through this very quickly, but this is exactly what you did. Um, you know, you're looking at for a lesson, a tutorial, or is it a full course? Um, and then, of course, you know, we talked about the learning management system, which in this case would be Schoology. And this is a process that is going to be in um, review and, and reflection and redo. It's a living um, kind of process. And it's a great thing to, again, I, I talked about PLC, professional learning communities, you know, uh, working with a department or grade level and actually working on curriculum together where you can also reflect and build your courses together. I think that's really important that um, the, the one thing about OER is, is the whole idea behind Creative Commons is that you're going to gain from it, but you're also going to um, give back to others. So that was that was the um, the the whole flow um, of of how this is um, done. Right. Well, uh, with all that said, I um, if you wanted to see a uh, Schoology more in action, whether it's um, pulling in OER resources or whether you want to see more about the different question types that are available in Schoology, obviously uh, demos are always available by going to Schoology.com and requesting a demo. Uh, like I said, we'll also be sending out some emails uh, just to. I'll let you know, uh, of course, not only the recording to this video, but also to answer any questions that you might have. Now, with that said, Fran, I just want to thank you again for being part of this presentation. I, I think it was really helpful for, for our audience. Um, as we went through, we were able to answer a lot of questions. Um, now, I know, though, Fran, that you also offer edu consultant services as well. So if districts are more confused about OERs than maybe they were before, <laughs> which I hope not, um, I you're hope available. Not. Is that correct? Um, well, you know, I, I work in this area, basically the, this area means the, the Connecticut, uh, Fairfield County area in Connecticut, but I certainly will be more than happy to have anyone um, contact me. You can um, get to me through my Twitter handle. Um, I'm at F Compar. Um, and I, that's one of the things I wanted to share is that I actually really use my uh, Twitter as a part of professional learning and sharing uh, resources. I often talk about OERs, I talk about different technology, and um, I talk about the library media profession, so I'd love to connect with you. Um, and if you want to contact me, you can also um, email me at fcompar at gmail.com, making it easy also for you to, to get a hold of me and, and we can talk further about it. Awesome. And if you want to talk specifically to Fran more, feel free to also, if you want to email us through the uh, webinar, uh, we can get you hooked up with, with her. Uh, with that said, our time is at an end. I really appreciate everyone who had a chance to come uh, attend our webinar today. Um, do something great with the rest of your day. Uh, hopefully you can build some great curriculum uh, the right way. Uh, everyone, uh, thanks again. It was a real pleasure. Thank you.